Hi, I'm Danny Wood, Time Team's Vine Specialist and Community Archaeologist. Today I'm joined by Time Team's Henry Chapman, archaeological surveyor on over a hundred Time Team episodes. He's Professor of Archaeology at the University of Birmingham and has recently been in the news regarding a collaborative research project between the University of Birmingham in the UK and the University of Ghent in Belgium. Now this research project involved looking at the area around Stonehenge. They did a geophysical survey covering an area of two and a half square kilometres and this survey revealed the presence of hundreds of prehistoric pits and one in particular was four metres wide, two metres deep and turned out to be Mesolithic dating back 10,000 years. So join me as I find out more about this Mesolithic pit and the wider landscape around Stonehenge in more detail. So welcome Henry. Hi Danny, no, it's, it's good to be here. How are you doing? I've not seen you for a while. No, I know, it's, it's funny isn't it? You, it's the thing with time team, it's so intense over, over short days and then and there's the gap and you sort of the other life takes over but but yeah it's been busy. It sounds like you've been really busy so tell us a bit more about this project how did it start I believe it's a collaborative project. Yeah oh, so we've been working at Stonehenge for well over a decade now uh, in various different projects you know probably one of the early ones was with um, an Austrian group the Ludwig Boltzmann Institute for Archaeological uh, Prospection but this most recent one and the one which has been in the press is a collaboration with the University of Ghent and particularly Philippe <laughs> Schmidt um, but we've been working in sort of a combination of geophysics, but also some uh, excavation as well, you know, sort of bringing things together. OK, I think it might be worthwhile us doing a quick recap of um, the archaeological periods because we're going to be jumping about, aren't we? Um, yes. So we're talking prehistory, um, specifically the Stone Age and the Stone Age breaks down into three sections. Um, so first we've got Paleolithic. Um, so Paleolithic just means ancient stone, ancient stone age. Um, that is two and a half million years ago to about 9,600 BC. Then we get the Mesolithic, meaning Middle Stone Age. That dates from about 9,600 to 4,000 BC. And this is the one we're going to be mainly talking about, the Mesolithic. Following on from the Mesolithic, we get the Neolithic, 4,000 BC to 2,500 BC. And together, all these three periods are, are known as the Stone Age. This is before they were using metal. They were using stone tools like axes, um, napping flint to make arrowheads and things like that. Um, and then after the Stone Age, they, they, you get the discovery of metal. People start making tools and things out of metal, jewellery and all sorts. So as I say, we're mainly looking at the Mesolithic period here, aren't we? The landscape then back in the Mesolithic would have been quite different, wouldn't it? It was attached to continental Europe. Um, there was that the, the bit of land called Doggerland now, which is underwater, um, but people would have been moving freely. Uh, it would have been quite wooded. We're talking about the time of hunter gatherers. People are nomadic. They're moving around, living in um, tents, um, possibly made of animal skin, hunting animals like auroch, red deer and boar and uh, living off plants, nuts and seeds uh, and things like that. So quite a different kind of landscape, wasn't it? I think this is one of the things. It's really hard to imagine anything which is wild. I just think about a wild landscape. And you know, to some extent, people are probably still managing their landscapes in certain ways, you know, to encourage animals in certain patterns. But yeah, you're talking about, you're talking about that period. I mean, it's just after the last ice age. You know, it's, it's the beginning of our current geological period. So it's a long time ago. It really is, isn't it? And you, to put it into perspective, I think mean, it's something like at least 4,000 years before the ancient Egyptians um, start building pyramids, isn't it? So, you know, it's just kind of such a long time ago. <laughs> it's hard to imagine. <laughs> yeah, and um, I, I suppose one of the other things, for most of most of human history, the human past, we have been hunter-gatherers. So the things which we know about, you know, because it's more recent, is actually just the blip, really, you know, for, for most of the existence of humans, We've been doing exactly what they were doing in this Mesolithic period. The research around Cheddar Man has been really interesting. So this is the oldest and most complete skeleton discovered in Britain at Cheddar Gorge in Somerset, southwest England. Um, and the Natural History Museum have been doing a project examining the DNA. Um, we know that he had um, dark hair, blue eyes, 
and dark to black skin pigmentation, which um, is really interesting. And they've also done DNA analysis on other skeletons from this time period around continental Europe and there's similar DNA as well. Um, so having set the picture, tell us about your project. Yeah, so I, I think what, one of the things which we, we've been doing geophysics for a long time, we've seen John, uh, particularly on Time Team, and actually, as you go through the episodes, you know, the general pattern, they, it covers bigger areas almost you know, as you go on through. Um, so we've been, we've been increasing the areas we cover, sort of it's more of a landscape study, and that, that's sort of one of, the, one of the formats of what we're doing. And, and the other one is actually different techniques, combining different techniques. Um, but what, what it's sort of the headline of it is, not only do we have sort of this seamless map of what's below Stonehenge, but also whenever you look at any geophysics, it's always, you see features in it, but there's always loads of, um, I, I think we tend to call them anomalies. So yeah. then, that's what, what John, call, John calls them. But, um, but they, these little blobs, yeah, so, so yeah, just these black blobs in, in them. Um, and many of these are pits. And really the focus of our project, which doesn't sound quite as exciting as the, the, the discoveries at Stonehenge, but what we're trying to do is understand pits and understand how they were shown in geophysics. So um, when you say pits, what kind of size are we talking? Um, what kind of shapes and why, why are pits important? Pits are everywhere. Whenever you look at geophysical data, whenever you excavate, you always find loads of pits. Yeah. But, um, but they're very difficult to date. And also from geophysics, you know, if you have a tree which falls over and sort of leaves a bit of a hole where the roots have pulled up, um, in geophysical terms, it looks quite a lot like a pit, you know, something which has been cut for a particular purpose. So trying to distinguish between these things. Um, but also to get beyond, generally, when we look at pits, if they form a circle or they form a particular shape, we can interpret that. But when we start having them just isolated, it gets much, much more difficult. So we wanted to try and characterise different types of pits to try and uh, go from this sort of mess of blobs to, well, which ones are probably going to be old trees? Um, and which ones are going to be real pits? And yeah, what else can we say from it? And can we do that in an automatic way? Now, you mentioned the size, and the size is really important because with geophysics, depending on how closely together you know, the resolution of your survey really dictates what size you can measure. So yeah, if, if, you're, if you're collecting data every metre, then anything smaller than a metre yeah, is going to be hard to see. Um, but with, in, in this instance, because of the, the way data's been collected and everything else, we, we're talking about um, some of the pits, probably over 400 pits, being over two and a half metres in diameter. So wow. yeah, the, the, these are substantial pits, you know, the little, or tree throws in some case, okay. but yeah, the, the big pits. But if you go smaller than that, you're talking thousands. And let's just think about the area that you surveyed as well, because this it was quite a large area, wasn't it? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a tremendous area. For anybody who sort of knows Stonehenge, we've gone all the way around it, pretty much everything you can see from Stonehenge itself, wow. you know, that sort of visual envelope, give or take, but I mean, it, it extends right to the north, um, to the Great Cursor. So all of the big principal monuments up to the northwest, of the, you know, going a bit further, you know, really sort of filling out a big block of land. Um, and what's quite important is that we know that Stonehenge was occupied and used over successive generations. You know, there's monuments from different periods there. And some of it is farming. You know, there's, there's prehistoric farming there. There's what is the monuments. Um, so actually getting a sense of everything all the way around. Um, one of the things I love about looking at landscape is not, not just looking at the monuments, looking at every square metre, you know, looking at everything, how it all joins together. So um, doing a big area all the way around Stonehenge without any gaps in it, I think it's really important. Mm. And um, so I gather this is the first time that's been done. The, the, the landscape around Stonehenge has been looked at in this way. Well, it's, it's, with, with this particular technique, so a, a, an earlier project, this is one with the Ludwig Boltzmann Institute. Um, with that, we, it was the big, first time we sort of used motorised geophysics. But, um, but that's where you had quad bikes and tractors pulling multiple arrays of geophysics, rather than having sort of people walk around in grids, like mm -hmm. you quite often see on Time Team. Um, yeah, th this was people sort of driving at 30 miles an hour across the landscape. With high resolution but so actually getting the complete picture and again lots of different techniques but the difference with this this new survey um it's not as high resolution actually as some of the early one or, or that earlier one mm -hmm. but what's important is because it's using a, a particular technique called uh, electrical mag uh, magnetic induction emi now all that means is basically when, whenever you do geophysics you're not measuring archaeology you're just measuring something else which tells you about archaeology 
So most of the time, what we're doing is we're looking at magnetic properties of soils, um, because generally when people do things, you know, burn fires or create rubbish, that changes the magnetic properties of the soil. So we can see that the detritus from people in ditches, we can see the patterns. So we tend to look, so we're measuring magnetics, magnetic properties of soils. Um, but the other thing we quite often do, I mean, there's many, but the other one is we look at the electrical conductivity of the soil. So the ability for uh, electrical current to run through the through soils. Mm -hmm. It's just another way of sort of, again, not measuring the archaeology, but indirectly measuring the archaeology. The yeah. great thing about EMI is it's doing both of those at once. Oh, OK. So, so it, it, it just basically means that you can you can sort of look at where if there's a if there's a blob on your geophysics visible in one of them and not in the other one. And then there's a different blob which is visible in both. You start making those comparisons, and that that becomes really important. The weird thing with with I suppose any landscape, yeah, it's, it's a bit like when, when when you go to time team and you look at the map beforehand, and and it's not until you get there you get a sense of scale. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it's, it's certainly the same with Stonehenge. You know, the you know, Stonehenge itself is a monument. It's quite tiny within the middle of a vast vast archaeological landscape. What we were then wanted to do, and this where this where I think it gets really exciting, because geophysical data, um, as we see on time team, is is fantastic, but it gets even better once you put a hole in the ground or you see what it's representing, um, and then it, that allows you to start understanding it. You can calibrate it. You can understand other areas. So that's really for me. That's a really exciting phase. Yes. So yes. So this project, it wasn't just doing the geophysics, was it? You actually then went and actually did some archaeological investigation you know, we're talking thousands of pits, you had to decide which ones to do. So how did you go about that? So, I mean, for the, the first time, I mean, geophysical, geophysical data is absolutely incredible. Um, and you don't, if you think how long it takes to dig a trench, you know, we, we've all been there. If you start thinking, well, to understand, you won't understand that sort of level of detail. And what trench gives you is that detail and sort of the three dimensions and all that kind of stuff and dates. Um, but what geophysics gives you is the breadth it gives you, you know, it's that seamless picture of the landscape, yeah, you know, every different area. Um, the difficulty you have is geophysics is slightly dependent on geology and, and other conditions. Uh, and until you actually, it, you, you, you basically have an idea of what's there. And it's normally a pretty good idea, um, uh, but you don't know exactly. You don't necessarily know the date of something. You don't necessarily know what it means. Um, and particularly in the case of pits, you just end up with a lot of blobs. Now, as with one of the reasons why this project was looking at pits and not sort of the outlines of henges or something, which is you know, much, much clearer, is because we understand more about henges. You know, we, we, you know, they, we can identify from shape, we can work out dates and that kind of thing. With pits, we can't. Yeah. So that's why we really had to get this stage of doing something, um, you know, something archaeological, you know, something actually in, in, invasive. Yeah. And we, we did that in two stages, but it's, it's just trying, we, we want to do as little as possible in order to calibrate and let the geophysics be understood. So I guess really, you know, geophysics is amazing, but you can't tell um, how old something is through geophysics, for instance, can you? So that's when the um, archaeological investigation comes in. Um, so let's talk a little bit about that, because um, some of the, um, the pits that you excavated are pretty spectacular. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. So let's talk about the pit that made the news. Um, why is this so significant? Well, it's uh, <laughs> for us. It's actually it's significance. There's two significances. One of those actually is, is a brilliant example of testing the data, but that's not the thing which is picked up on. It's it's, it's because it's it turned out to be a massive pit, but it, it, that in itself is exciting. But it's, it's dates, you know, just how old it was, which made it really hit the news. Um, and that's because it, it comes from the early Mesolithic period. So you, know, you went through the periods earlier on. That is incredibly early. Yeah, it really is, isn't it? And so the size of the pit is about four metres by two metres deep. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's about four metres at the top and, uh, and, and it's two metres deep. But it's actually its shape. It narrows down in sort of a, into a sort of conical shape. So it's narrow at the bottom, okay. um, almost like a funnel. How do you know that it's early Mesolithic? Oh, well, so, so a number of things happened. Well, one of those, because before we actually excavated the 20 sites we did, we went across the whole landscape and did some coring, you know, just to have sort of sample what, what we're going to get. And, um, and in it, we found a little bit of charcoal, which we managed to date, radiocarbon date. 
and that gave us a mesolithic date. We thought, mm, yeah, well, you know, fingers crossed. And then, so it was obviously one of the ones which we were going to choose. Um, but yeah, so that, that, that's been confirmed with radiocarbon, but also through uh, microliths, so, so through actual lithics in, in the base, in, right at the base of the pit. So wow. we, it's really, really securely dated to that early Mesolithic period. So microliths are these tiny, tiny flint tools, aren't they? Um, which are just amazingly skillfully made, um, made during the Mesolithic period. Um, and sorry, can I just understand, was the charcoal in the pit as well, kind of? There are the, the, the bits of charcoal sort of throughout the sequence. Okay. So, so what, what we're worried about, yeah, you know, fortunately that the charcoal we got in the core was towards the bottom. Yeah, right. but there had been, you know, it reasonably quickly infilled as well um, as, as a pit. But yeah, so I mean, it's, it's really nice when your artifacts match your radiocarbon dates and everything comes together. Yeah. So what was the purpose of this pit? Yeah, well, this this is this is a real challenge. I mean, I, the, I, I think the when you try to think about the purpose of the pit, I think the, the first thing is where, where are the parallels? You know, because normally we sort of you, you can interpret what something's from either because it, it, it sort of shouts it out from the archaeology, which pits don't necessarily do unless it's full of rubbish, um, or by looking at other examples. And the thing is, there aren't any other examples. I mean, there, there's some smaller pits in northern France which are Mesolithic. It's it's really hard. To, to get any comparison, but given the shape of it and, um, and the, the huge amount of effort, it's dug into chalk, and that's not easy to, to hack out with, you know, bits of antler pick and that kind of no. thing. So it's, it's, it's quite hard to sort of know what it's for, but I mean, what, one, one possible interpretation is it, it would work as an animal trap. So if you, you know, as, as, a, as, a, um, as a trap, so animals would fall into it, particularly with a narrow bottom. But I mean, this is this one of those areas which now we're seeing pits. How many other pits are there like this? Yeah. How can we start interpreting? It's it's not until you know you've kind of raised it, people are, are going to start looking for it more in the archaeological landscape. People are yeah. going to be seeing it. It's almost like you know these potentially these pits have been hiding in plain sight, haven't they? Um, and wouldn't it be fantastic to actually find out more about the purpose? You know, maybe at some point in the future, um, you'll discover a, a similar pit, but it'll have some auric bones in it or something yeah, like that. <laughs> a broken leg. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so is that the best guess then that it's probably for hunting animals or a kind of animal trap? Yeah, yeah, I, I think so. I mean, it is, it's really hard. I mean, one of the problems, you know, with, with as you look at sort of later periods, you sort of have, well, it must be somehow religious or what, yeah. But the Mesolithic, we generally sort of think, you know, it's quite a pragmatic period in many ways. Um, and the, although there, you know, there's always bits, you know, there's always that mixture of, of different types of symbolic activity and so on. But to build a huge pit is not something we've really seen before. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, even if it is for catching animals, it's still a huge amount of effort. But um, you know, we, we know there's bits of burning going on around it. We know, you know, just because of the fill, we know there's other activities. But um, but yeah, it's, it's probably probably the best bet at the moment, or best guess, um, until we come up with another one. Yeah, but that's the exciting thing about archaeology. I know it is, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it never stays still, does it? No. <laughs> um, so, do we know how long? Obviously, it's been infilled. This pit um, was it deliberately infilled in one go, or left open and then just filled up over time? Do we know that? It looks like it's sort of it's not been particularly deliberately filled, particularly not higher up. It's yeah, it has has filled in gradually over time. And I think one of the one of the really interesting factors, and the reason I'm sort of on you know sort of pausing there, is because I think yeah if. if if you knock down a hat, or if, if a house go in the middle of town, you know, stops being lived in, eventually the roof comes off. And for a good number of years, we all, we all recognise it. You know, we, we, we see it. And, and we see it as that dilapidated house as it's falling down. Um, and at some point, it gets covered up or built into another. The reason I'm saying that is with a, with a pit, if you've got a pit, which is such an unusual thing for that period, in the middle of the woodlands, it's the sort of thing which, if it's useful, you're going to maintain it. Yeah, we don't have the evidence for the sort of cleaning it out or anything, but it's but it's that sort of thing. Um, if it's useful, but once it stops being used, how long is it recognised? Yeah, when if you have communities, how many people are going through that landscape and seeing it? I think this is a it's quite a, an interesting idea for all of our archaeology. Yeah, so, so what? It, how long does that stay as a as something in the landscape? How long do people recognise what it was and what it was used for? And whether, like you say, it would have been kind of curated because you go, oh, that's a useful pit, you know. Yes. We'll keep that. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, I'll hold that. on to that. 
or are, you know i mean i wonder there's a, potentially other you know i don't I've, actually have you heard of um potato uh, obviously they didn't have potatoes then um uh, but potato clamps which um you know in the you know when you've got allotments you actually uh, have a glut of potatoes you dig um a big pit in the earth and you chuck all your potatoes in cover yeah. them over and they store really well um, so I'm wondering whether there could be some kind of equivalent sort of food storage pit or something, but it sounds quite big. I mean, four metres across, that's, yeah, no, that's probably too big for that, isn't it? It's one of those answers on a postcard, you know. It's, um, it really is. Yeah, it, it's, it's, <laughs> but I mean, when, when you're going back that far in the past, when you're talking about 10,000, over 10,000 years ago, um, this, pit, this pit was dug and used. And, you know, there's, that's a really long time. And that's trying to understand just... It, we think about function, but also think about the mindset of people at that time. How do they think? How how similar were they to us? They're biologically the same. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, although you know the, 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 some of the sort of DNA, as you said, some of the DNA research has been absolutely fascinating. Yeah. But um, they're the same size, the same. You know, yeah, same absolutely. Capabilities. They were hum human humans, weren't they? You know, modern yeah. humans, but um, just must have seen. Um, and lived in the landscape in such a different way, then, you know, it's mm. quite difficult for us to imagine in a way, I think. Yeah. Just thinking about, I mean, the crazy thing is, we're talking, you know, a good couple of thousand years or so before Stonehenge. Yeah. Um, is there any connection, any crossover? Um, is it just a coincidence? Um, I mean, it's difficult to tell because it's quite, you know, we're looking at a huge time scale. But I wonder if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, I, I do. I'm, and you can't help but have thoughts on this sort of thing. I, mean, <laughs> I think, I mean, the, the first thing, I mean, it's the largest you know, pit of that that period, you know, being discovered. And you think, well, yeah, typically that'll be found at Stonehenge. Yeah, you know, of course it will, because everything, you know, Stonehenge has, you know, has this draw in terms of so many sort of unique and and new earliest those, those sorts of findings. Um, so in, in, in some ways, I mean, I, yeah, obviously time will tell if we find more and all that kind of thing. But yeah, I, I think it probably does have a significance in terms of Stonehenge. I think Stonehenge become or became quite a special place very, very early, much earlier than than how we see things. And we, we do have little inklings of evidence for this as well. You know, from from the some of the earlier survey work we've done with the Ludwig Boltzmann Institute, where um, things things like the the positioning of Stonehenge not the not Stonehenge itself but the heel stone so if anybody's visited Stonehenge you can see sort of the circle of stones or circles of stones just outside on the northeast side there's um there's another stone and it's unusual it's quite big but it's also undressed it hasn't been shaped it's just been sort of shoved you know as as it is and um, that's the heel stone now that position um lines up with with pits which were found you know Far to the north, actually within the cursus, the Great Cursus, and you know the, the very long enclosure, which is quite hard to see on the ground now. Um, but all of this lines up with what would have been the summer solstice, you know, sun, uh, sunrise, sunset, in rest of these pits. We don't have dates on the pits, but it seems to be focusing at least all of. The, and there's other things like this which focus all the attention. Actually, Stonehenge itself, the earliest Stonehenge was just outside, just just around that heel stone, and it's. Everything which happens around about 3,100 BC, about you know, just over 5,000 years ago, that's when Stonehenge starts to become you know, the really earliest stage of it. But before that, I think, and we need to confirm it, I think it's already on that northeast side. And I think that, the, mm -hmm. that, that that's taking us well back. You know, we're moving closer and closer to that Mesolithic period. We still have a few thousand years yep. to try and explain. But you know, you're getting in that, that area, and I just think the area is something special. <laughs> And actually, um, I did an interview a while back with Professor David Jakes um, at the University of Buckingham, um, and he's got a really interesting site, Blick Mead, which I'm sure you're aware of. Um, how does that tie in with your work? Well, it's, isn't it interesting that suddenly within the Stonehenge landscape, that Mesolithic period has become important? You know, who would have thought? Because all the monuments, you know, they're, they're Neolithic and Bronze Age, you know, they're way later. And suddenly, because of Blick Mead um, and... And Blitmead's also interesting. I've been talking about how pragmatic the Mesolithic is, but obviously there's other things going on at Blitmead with the colours and, yeah. and, and so on. So, um, yeah, and particularly sort of getting, we're getting early as well. It's not just the late Mesolithic. You know, we're getting into the earlier, really early, early periods. And just to recap, what's really interesting about that is that they discovered that the stream has um, particular properties where if you put stone in it, the minerals that are in the stream um, kind of turn stone pink. 
a really kind of bright pink that may have been used for a dye or something like that. Either way, it would have been pretty significant. You're wandering through the landscape and you're kind of used to browns and greens and then you've got this bright pink kind of stone. Brilliant, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it really is. Um, and so, sorry, but yeah, we were saying that we are starting to see the Mesolithic much more in that area mm. than had been previously. Yeah, I mean, I, pr really prior to, prior to Dave's work, um, all we knew about the Mesolithic in the area was the car park, the old car park. Yeah. If, any, if anybody visited Stonehenge quite a while ago now, you know, before the new visitor centre, the, the, the old car park used to have these, um, it looked like very small roundabouts painted yeah. Yeah, as, as you went through. And, and they were the positions of a line of, of post holes or pits or something, you know, but they're Mesolithic. Some of them held wood and there was some debate about whether or not they were sort of totem poles, you know, something like that. But really that was the... That was the only sort of significant monuments. To the, and, and now we've got all of this yeah. you know, for that Mesolithic period. It's such an interesting time because you've got the early Mesolithic, um, but then going all the way through to that kind of cusp where you start to get the towards the end of the Mesolithic, that way of life, that hunter-gathering lifestyle, um, and the Neolithic where people are starting to settle down and to farm and grow things. We're looking at agriculture. That's quite a big jump, isn't it? Quite a quite a change there going on, quite an interface. And it does make you wonder what was happening within that landscape there. The, so some of these changes, I think, are utterly fascinating, not, not just in terms of what happens, but how does that change how people think about their world? Now, at what point do, and, and it, is, is this even a valid question, but yeah, as humans as just animals within the environment or humans separating themselves from nature, and is that a thing? Or, you know, when does it happen? You know, there's big debates to have to have there, and then in terms of what actually happens, you know, what, what we talk about agriculture, but what what do we mean? Mm. Yeah, you know, what, what does it actually look like? You talk about sort of because in the you know, are we thinking about controlling your environment, which you can do by a bit of burning vegetation and encouraging new growth for, to encourage animals to come, or you could do it by farming. Um, you know, it's it's not necessarily an abrupt thing, but there are certainly some really big abrupt changes that happen. Uh, exactly you know, what that means, but I think it's a mindset shift. And I don't, you know, the I mean, I've got, I got I could go on, but I mean, it's, it's how it also impacts on population sizes, and suddenly things like coercion and control and all the sort of political things that we talk about. Um, yeah, that transition is utterly fascinating. Yes, isn't it? And actually, what's going on at that time as well, kind of geographically, is um, you've got the rising sea levels. So Doggerland is flooding um, and Britain's becoming an island. So I don't know whether is that a coincidence or, you know, is, is that all sort of tied in with it somehow? I don't know. I don't know if anybody knows. No, it's, I mean, I, I think... So more recent Mesolithic studies, you know, or, or maybe sort of better to say early Mesolithic studies, you, know, you, you start looking at the patterns of things and you, know, you start seeing so much stuff on coasts where they are now. Yeah. And, and, and you realise actually that wasn't the coast then. Yeah. And, and you think, well, are we just looking at the very edge of where the great richness of society was? Um, and you do get pockets inland. Maybe Stonehenge is one of these sort of pockets of something different. But um, but yeah, it does make you wonder actually what what we're we not seeing beneath the North Sea um, and and around you know Liverpool Bay and so on and so forth, um, or elsewhere, yeah, Sunderland, yeah, you know, the other, yeah, you know, this isn't just happening in Britain. These areas of of sea, what are now seabed, were dry land, you know, connecting, um, yeah, you know, the Bering Straits, for example. Yeah, so there's so many of these different areas. Um, yeah, and actually, what that means, I, I'm always fascinated by. Um, areas like Howick, so up in the north yeah. northeast coast of of England, um, sort of on the coast, you, 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 you've you've got a Mesolithic house, and it's round about it's a little bit later than the pit at Stonehenge. It's around about seven thousand five hundred BC, um, and it's not on the side. There seems to be just hints, just hints of um, this what we see later on in the, in the Neolithic in terms of people settling down. But only for like 500 years, then it keeps on going. It goes back again to this hunter gatherer lifestyle. What's going on there? Yeah, it's it's utterly fascinating. Yeah, you know, what a great period. Yeah, it really is as well. And we should actually mention um, uh, another really famous Mesolithic site, Star Car, mm. as well. Um, and that's really um, famous for all the uh, antlers that were discovered there. 
um i mean that's fascinating you know what what's happening there <laughs> oh yeah well, so, so stark i mean yeah you're right i mean it is it was it was one of the first sort of sites to be studied really really um carefully it's close to my heart as well because it's a wetland site and it's it's that mixture of environmental archaeology it's kind of one of the sites where that started in many ways um, but what's great is um, people like Nicky Milner have, have taken that back up recently. And they've re-excavated things. And, and it, that's great in so many different ways because we can sort of measure how archaeology develops. We can measure how things are preserved or not. Um, but also we can go back to these big questions. I mean, what, what are those, the, the antler headdresses all about? If they are headdresses. You know, we're talking about, if anybody doesn't know them, they're, they're basically this, is deer antlers, but with part of the skull attached. So I'm, I'm using my hands to try and explain that. I don't know if that helps. But these things are perforated, so they could have been tied onto, onto a headdress. So, you know, and one of the things that these use in dance, are these use in sort of ceremonies, you know, what are they for? Um, but what, what it does do is it, it takes away from thinking these people are just hunting things, fishing, you know, um, gathering. They, but they're people. They have these societies. You know, they're, they're, they're social animals. We are social animals. We do other things. Some of these things don't always make obvious sense to others. Yeah, true. Um, but they're like us. Yeah, they are us. Yes, yeah, absolutely. It's it's just fascinating to think, isn't it? So the fantastic thing is what you're doing here with your research is really seriously advancing our knowledge and understanding of the Mesolithic. If people want to find out more, where can they find your research paper? Yeah, so it's it's published in a journal called Journal of Archaeological Science, um, but there's also been a lot of uh, news coverage as well. So I mean, actually, uh, for, for for a sort of an instant insight into it you know actually just just getting you know having a look at some of those those articles as well and one of the great things i think um and this always reminds me of time team as well one of the great things about um uh, or comparing what what newspapers say comparing what could be right in the academic article is that um when you start talking to journalists they start asking you questions which actually matter you know it's, it's, whereas, and, and within the scientific paper you don't always go on to those questions so actually if you get the chance to look at both that's quite good fun too Yes, yeah, definitely. In fact, I liked the, the well, it's, it's, it's interesting because you've described the methodology and the techniques, uh, the geophysics, um, and how you went about doing the research. But I really particularly liked um, the section where um, the discussion about the pits mm -hmm. um, and, you know, what they might be. And actually, one thing that we've not mentioned is obviously we've focused on the Mesolithic with this, uh, the discovery of this large pit. Um, but what about some of the other ones that you excavated? Maybe we could just touch on that briefly. Yeah, I mean, one of the things we, across the group of trenches, I mean, there, there were things which, um, yeah, there were some of them were tree throws, which is good because, you know, we, we were measuring different sort of parameters. But there are also a lot of other pits, you know, things like um, early Neolithic pits, middle Neolithic pits. And some of those were quite spectacular. And, and there are, oh, there's, there's Stonehenge is just brilliant. I'll just, I'll just start by saying that. <laughs> but um, but some of these pits, they seem to be built on um, sort of solution hollows, so sort of glacial, you know, just where you got sort of the, the ice melting and sort of creating hollows and all that. And it looks like some of these pits are, are taking advantage of things which are just naturally there. And I don't think that's laziness. I think they I think they are. I think they they have some significance. They're enhancing it. Um, but yeah, so many pits. Some of these really large pits. And I think what it shows is it just how busy the Stonehenge landscape was. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, first the geophysics shows that, but when you start excavating these, yeah, every single period you're, still, you're covering you know, all of prehistory with different pits, different activities, um, particularly up to the Bronze Age. When I was studying, Stonehenge was sort of, you had Stonehenge in the middle, you learned the sort of monuments around it, and that's what it was. Yeah. And, what, and, and now we have the ability to look in the bits in between with sort of this sort of resolution. What you find is there's loads of other stuff as well. And some of that stuff's the same period as different phases of Stonehenge. It's not, there are no blank spaces. Everything, yeah, it's a busy landscape. Um, and I think that's, that's quite a transformation of how we think about that. Yeah, it really is. And um, a busy landscape for thousands of years. I, I suppose I mean, the, the other thing which I always think is, is funny about Stonehenge is that you drive around there and everything's there. It's, it's kind of almost like it's been frozen in time a little bit. But what you're looking at, as, as you go across there, you're seeing, well, the final stage of what well, people stop moving stones around and all that Stonehenge. You've got the barrow, you've got the sort of early Bronze Age material, and even you've got some of the field systems. If the light's right, you can see the field systems, as well, mm. which are a bit later yeah. again. Um, and it's just such a mixture of periods. And it looks, because it's all grassed over, it all looks like just one thing. 
And I think if you know, if, if any, anybody's thinking about going to Stonehenge, I think one of the most profitable things you to do you can do. It's a bit like it's a bit like doing a crossword puzzle. Puzzle. It's a bit like you know going out there and trying to work out what goes when <laughs> and then the order, and then to, to try and imagine what would it be like without that, and why do they do that there? You know, th those are the things which I think is absolutely magnificent about Stonehenge. And effectively, what we're doing with the geophysics is identifying other things to fill some of those gaps as well. Amazing stuff. And are you due to do any more research in the area? Um, we are planning to, um, although I mean, we, 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 we get to that point of writing up and completing everything. And then, you know, so but yeah, in, in a year or two, we're, we're definitely going to be back down there. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, will you keep us updated? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, the, and the, one of the things which there's nothing quite like being in a trench. Um, you, you know, it's like you get a focus, you, you're digging away. And, and it's when you stand up, you know, sort of stretch your back a bit and you look up and you're facing Stonehenge. Yeah. And that is yeah. just such a, it's magical, but also really bizarre. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Well, we're very lucky, aren't we, with um, oh, the work yeah. that we do. Yeah, it's great fun. It is, it is, yeah. So, Henry, thank you so much for um, joining me today. And that was really, really interesting discussion. Really great to Oh, it's a real pleasure, Danny. Cheers. All right, well, catch up with you soon, hopefully, on the next I day. hope so. Yep. <laughs> See ya. Cheers. All right, thanks, Henry.